Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii, filling in for Dr. Keli'i Akina. He's the president of our institute and the host of this program normally. Uh, today, we're talking about easing barriers to housing on the Big Island. Uh, the Grassroots Institute, we often talk about housing all over the state and all the barriers to housing, but we want to zero in today on the Big Island. And our guest today is Zendo Kern. He's the Hawaii County Planning Director. So thanks so much for being with us, Zendo. We look forward to learning a lot more about the Big Island and housing. Aloha, Joe. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. So how long have you been the county's planning director and um, what's your background? Sure. Yeah. So I became the planning director of just about a year and three quarters ago. Um, so the Roth administration came in at the end of uh, 2020 in December. So we hit the ground ru running. Um, my background is I'm born and raised here on the Big Island. Uh, actually born on the west side, grew up on the east side. I have over 22 years of experience in uh, land use, real estate development, and in and out of government. So kind of came into it with more on the development, constructing, how to put it together, moved into land use and entitlements. Uh, then I had the opportunity to actually chair the uh, Windward Planning Commission for a couple years. I also had the opportunity to serve as a, a county council member, chaired the planning committee there. Uh, and from there, I moved more into specifically uh, land use entitlements, consulting um, both in and out of projects. So kind of on the other side of the desk, helping people navigate the process to, to create housing. Um, and my back, I've had multiple businesses. So I kind of have a, a general real estate business in and, as I say, in and out of public service. So that's more or less it. And then I decided to uh, see what I could do and serve our county uh, as the planning director, which has been a really awesome opportunity. So you've been involved in housing on the Big Island for a long time, it sounds like, um, and even living in housing on the Big Island, you know, growing up here and everything. So um, what is your, what is it, exactly does your job entail on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, you know, our, being a planning director is a, a really serious job. We have six different divisions. So we deal with anything from uh, short range land use, you know, matters such as a setback variance to a subdivision. Uh, all the way through to discretionary permits, say like a change of zone or a change of land use boundary amendment, uh, SMA approval, special permits. And then we move into long range planning. So like shoreline setback studies, general plan studies, really, you know, trying to tackle the climate change uh, and all of those factors. Uh, in addition, um, we have a West Hawaii office. We have offices on both sides. I also am in charge of the uh, Kilauea recovery efforts from the 2018 Kilauea eruption. That's like the sixth division. So it's really all planning from short range to long range. Um, we deal with building permits, but not to the same extent that other counties do that we probably get into a little bit more later. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, well, when we were originally trying to um, queue up this in this episode, we were really thinking a lot about permits, um, along with many other issues on the Big Island. And and it's kind of funny that the Big Island doesn't actually um, have its planning department in charge of the permitting primarily, where on the other counties, the planning department is in charge of permitting. So um, that that's probably something that gets, gets confusing to a lot of people, huh? It, it, it is confusing. Uh, it's confusing for the general public. It's, it's extra confusing for people that are coming, say, from, you know, Oahu or, or Maui. And so the way it works here is the building division is housed underneath the Department of Public Works. because It's a separate division. They have their own uh, building chief and the building divisions. They come through and then we review the permits from a land use perspective. Um, and so just just kind of give you an idea. When I first came into this position, uh, the planning department's review of the permits was taking around three months. Um, about four months into the process, we got our review time for building permits down to around three days. And we've been holding true to that ever since. So when it hits the planning department, it's generally smooth and efficient. We try to do a good job communicating with our constituents. I see. I see. Well, um, that's important because permitting apparently takes a long time. Well, on all the islands across the state. So anything to make it quicker uh, is good. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to just zoom out and look at the big picture on the Big Island. I mean, when you just look across the Big Island, um, what is the picture regarding housing? Um, how difficult is it to build there? You know, building housing is 
is is difficult um, here. Obviously, it's it's underscored. We have lots of challenges, lots of regulations. What happens though is we have kind of compounded effects over time, uh, and these compounded different elements from having actual units like say the land entitlements, the actual subdivisions ready to go, or the zoning in place to do that. Because you got to have all of the land use side of it, all of your permits ready to go before it's shovel ready. So previously, many years past, there was a lot of people that would want to, or developers that would come in, and I call it cradle to grave. They would take a piece of land, they would go through the entitlement process all the way through to being able to actually get legitimate permits to put in the infrastructure to build the subdivision, and then build the houses and go vertical. Over the time, things have changed. You have people that specialize more in land use entitlements, and then you have people that specialize more in the vertical construction or people that want things to be shovel ready. Very different uh, mindsets and approaches. And so both sides of it were challenged with here. There's been a real um, shortage of actual zoned entitled unit. And what happens is they actually have time conditions based on them. So they actually have to do something within X period of years. And then if you hit a bad market cycle or an off market cycle, it comes back down. And next thing you know, they're coming in for these entitlements, but then they're forced to go through the whole discretionary permitting process again. So one of the things that we're really focused on is trying to, um, what I can focus on anyways, is really the, the land use side of it, the entitlement side of it, to get things so it's clear and concise. If you're in the area that we want it to be, um, that's where it should be. We still have to make sure that there's checks and balances, that it you know, respects the environment, respects the culture, et cetera, and our sense of place, but it should be a lot smoother to get through mm -hmm. that. Um, well, but and across the state, by the way, I mean, if you're just talking about land use, you've got the State Land Use Commission, and you have all these different layers of regulation um, from the state level to the county level. But just at the state level, and of course, we have 5% of the land, which is zoned or designated as urban with, with few exceptions, is the only zone that really allows home building for regular people, you know. Uh, low-rise apartments, neighborhoods, or close-knit housing, and things like that. Now, on the big island, the urban zone is only 2% of the island. Um, and so that's a very small percentage of the whole island. Uh, has anyone in county government ever talked about increasing the amount of land that's available for more housing? Yeah, it's actually a discussion that we have um, quite a bit, and I think it's being underscored right now. And so two elements with that, as you say, that there's this underlying state land use designation, right? And the county's authority to change that goes up to 15 acres. So, right. we so, so basically, 50, if, if it's 16 acres, then the state has to do that, right? Correct. And it actually goes through our process all the way through the planning commission and then up to the state land use for their for their consideration on it. And it adds a, a complete another layer of challenge, another layer of bureaucracy, if you will, uh, another layer of uncertainty. And my understanding is many years back, the state land use commission would do more bound, boundary district amendments. Right. So they come into an area and say this area is poised for growth. Let's look at a large swath and actually just go ahead and do that boundary amendment to, to urban, right? To kind of set the, the, the field up to then play out on the county zoning. And I haven't seen that happen for a number of years. Um, and last year, we uh, worked on some legislation to help with that. That was challenged. Right. Last year, um, I remember HB 1840 would have allowed the county decision-making officials to amend the district boundary amendments to allow land for greater areas than 15 acres. So just like you were talking about, you could change it to 50 acres, five zero. And, uh, but there were some conditions on that too. At least 60% of the land had to be dedicated to affordable housing. Um, and Grassroots Institute, our organization actually testified on the bill twice uh, in the house, but then it died uh, quietly in the Senate. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that uh, policy proposal and that bill? Uh, would that have helped the housing situation? Yeah, I believe it would have helped the housing situation. So knowing that there's um, you know, a, a growing evolution of county and its authority, right? So maybe 20 years ago, the LUC, the State Land Use Commission, kind of having that uh, overview was, was critical. I feel though now the county has really, the counties have grown into their own. So we wanted to look at it and say, hey, we should have the authority to be able to do up to say the 50 acres, which is actually consistent with our project district, 
which is a, it's just our project district zoning really allows for that kind of TOD mixed use live work play development. So I thought linking those two up would make, would make sense. And also wanted to link it up to the 60% affordable housing. And the reason for that is we want to ensure people, this is really towards getting affordable housing. Give us this opportunity to show that we can actually administer this well. And as we do, then let's open up that conversation for maybe just more uh, authority on our end. Uh, there was some concerns around that um, from, from various parties, and unfortunately it didn't make it through. I'm gonna approach it again this year. I'm gonna adjust some of the strategies, rehab the conversation and try to better articulate um, the need for this, as well as the land use regulations and policies that we have in place, because a lot of people get concerned or fearful, or oh, you're going to allow that to happen, they're going to do it anywhere. That's not the case. It has to meet our general plan. It has to meet our community development plans, which really say this is the only area you can do it within our urban growth boundary areas, right? So that's the goal is to bring that back up and hopefully be honored with the ability to actually help solve some of our, our, our island's challenges. Well, and also... Um... There are like six layers of housing regulation, you know, at the state level and the county level. So when we talk about uh, removing one of the layers, that still leaves five layers <laughs> of um, of regulation. And a lot of those layers can be duplicative. I mean, uh, at the county level, and um, you're basically doing a lot of the same stuff that they look at at the state level when it comes to land use designations, right? That's right. Actually, a lot of it's the exact same. And a lot of it kind of relates to conditions that we impose on those applications. And so the goal was is to take the feedback from all the various agencies as we do, whether that's Department of Education or, you know, uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Health, and condition the, the project so they have to comply with these. So it creates, you know, community, right? And that's kind of the concern. But I think we're all, I don't know, feel like Hawaii County is at its time to actually be allowed to do that. I see. And well, you know, it's interesting to me. I, I used to live on the Big Island, uh, actually in, in Honamu, and I have family in Paradise Park right now. And Paradise Park, see, um, the way I remember it is one acre lots with single family homes on there. Uh, is that ag land? And is the reason that they've made that all um, one acre lots to comply with the zoning code? or um, Or is that urban? Or how does that work? Yeah, so HPP, Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian Paradise Park, I believe it's the second largest subdivision in the United States, if not the world, it's, it's huge. And so what happened is that subdivision was actually put in right before all of the laws came into place in the late 1960s. And what it is, is it's actually state land use agriculture and county zoned ag. But the reality of it is, is that is not consistent with the settlement pattern out there. What's consistent with that settlement pattern is really a state land use rural, and the zoning could still be ag or the zoning could be residential ag, but that underlying state land use of rural, so put it to you this way, we live in a rural community, right? I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say that we're rural. 0.003% of our island is zoned rural, 837 acres. So the goal that we have underneath our general plan is to say, okay, this area is urban, top could still be ag or residential ag, and, and maybe, you know, tighter density from there, but that we'd look at that, but really trying to bring some of these areas into play. I have subdivisions that are actually 12,000 square foot lots that are state land use ag and county zoning ag. And the neighbors are like, why can my neighbor have all these chickens on a 10,000 square foot lot? Well, because you know, kind of need to do some housekeeping on that. So we have two kind of issues that are going on. We have some housekeeping issues on some existing. And then we also really need to start really taking the field that we have, this, 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 this canvas, if you will, and paint what we want there, but to get the regulations so they're actually ready to move forward. And if, the, um, if housing projects can't get through because of, you know, the zoning, um, maybe it's zoned ag and, and we could put more houses there if it were zoned urban. If that doesn't happen, then what we're hearing from developers is that they just shrug their shoulders and say, okay, then we'll just build a mansion or we'll build high-end housing. You know, we'll build one house, one very expensive house on an acre. And so um, can you speak a little bit to that is the unintended consequence of uh, all this regulation? Yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big one. It's a lot easier for folks just to go get a building permit. You know, they're entitled to it. It's a right for them to do it versus actually creating that density. And so we see two things occur frequently. One is, you know, screw it. I'm just going to build a big old house on it and call it a day. 
and somebody gets a big old house. The other thing we see is basically reverse engineering it to meet the most minimum standards. So say a project that would allow for 100 units, well, they bring it back down to say only doing 40 units because then it's a different wastewater requirements. It's various other requirements that are lesser. Now, it makes sense because even at 100 units, they don't actually pencil out well because of the infrastructure. So one of the big issues, we have all of these, these governmental regulations, but infrastructure is huge. It is one of the biggest impediments that we have, water and wastewater. And as a county, we're looking to actually focus on where we want that to be and provide that. So then the person coming in that could do 100 units has infrastructure to hook up to, and now they're incentivized to do the 100 units versus reversing it back to the minimum because they can't afford this huge CapEx to bring in all that infrastructure, if that makes sense. So it's kind of, it's mm -hmm. going to take both sides coming together. I see. Well, um, we're going to take a short break. Uh, this is Hawaii Together, and uh, we're talking to Zendo Kern uh, more in a minute. Aloha and welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting ne Network. I'm Joe Kent, filling in for Dr. Kelly Iakina, um, and um, we are talking with Zendo Kern, who is the County Planning Director on the Big Island on Hawaii Island. And so, Zendo, when we were originally preparing this episode, we had some questions about permitting, and and since the Planning Department though deals with permitting on the other counties, it doesn't do that on the big island. Um, we uh, are shifting our interview to not talk so much about permitting, but I did want to get your take because on Hawaii Island, permitting is a big issue. We've got the, um, you know, a huge backlog. Um, there's a new uh, system, the EPIC system, which is the Electronic Processing and Information Center. Um, that's supposed to cut through the congestion, but it still seems to have hit somewhat of a snag. Do you have any comment about how that process is going? Yeah, I do. Um, and I've been uh, right there with DPW and the building division this entire time. Because when we launched the EPIC system, it was launched for both the planning department as well as the building department. So we're operating off the same electronic uh, permitting system, essentially. And so two things happen with the building department. They came in with a new code, building code, as well as the EPIC system at the same time. Anytime you have a code shift, you usually have a glut of permits that come in and ramp that up. So that didn't help. Um, you know, and one of the things we've seen a big challenge, challenge with is the great resignation. So really getting qualified folks to work within the department has been challenging. Now, getting the building permit system so it's smooth and efficient is one of Mayor Roth's top priorities. And so what we've seen through this is working through the glut, working through the challenges um, are, are, we need to bring in somebody else. So they brought in an outside consultant, uh, Jim Tenner, who's doing a full on eval of the process and system to give us his best you know, practices and suggestions on some, some adjustments to be made. And he's been in uh, counties that had a, a time that wasn't acceptable and has brought it into a time that is uh, acceptable. So what I'm seeing over there is, you know, this diligent effort that, hey, it, we, we know that it isn't the way that we want it to be right now. We got it. Here's what we're going to do to continue to move forward. And so I'm seeing that happen. Granted, none of it's fast enough. You know, the time that we're in, it, it's it, and, and, and we all know that. But I will say that they, they're aware of it and diligently making the effort. And I see it coming from Mayor Roth. You can tell he's just like, we got to get this thing moving. And so I'm seeing I'm seeing progress. 
Okay, well, thanks for that. Uh, you know, we're looking at permitting on all the other islands too, and it just seems like there's a back backlog on uh, all the island islands, and and so we're all trying to do it. And so, grassroot, uh, we'll, we would love to talk about that further on an, another episode. But uh, today, I want to talk about other because permitting is just one piece of the puzzle. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, and one is um, public hearing. Uh, on, you know, in Hawaii, we have many, many public hearings often that are re required for housing projects. Often, if you want to rezone a land from agricultural to urban, you need a public hearing. But when that happens, you've got a lot of groups that come out and say, not in my backyard, you know, you build somewhere else, uh, right? And so we've, uh, those groups are called the NIMBYs, not in my backyard. But mm -hmm. sometimes there's lots of people who don't even get to weigh in on projects um, who might very much want the housing. So can you talk about how that process plays out on the Big Island? Yeah, I mean, I think it's playing out the similar that what you're seeing is we do have a tremendous amount of public hearings. You know, we go through a planning commission hearing then to a county council hearing. And what we're seeing is a lot of folks show up that say not in my backyard. And what I'm also seeing is it's turning into the entire island. So not on not on our island, period. And that's challenged when you look at the folks that couldn't show up at those meetings, right? And what I try to think about, and I thought about this a lot as a county council member, because you're elected there to make tough decisions. And so we always need to think about who isn't present. And these are folks that are working as hard as they can to put food on the table. They're trying to get their kids, you know, to school. They're trying to provide for their family. And they oftentimes, they don't have time to show up to a public hearing at 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock. And so I'm trying to encourage folks to do that, especially the millennials and Gen Zs. I mean, this is their future. And if they're not showing up to advocate for, you know, for housing, it's really tricky because the folks that sit there as, as a volunteer commissioner, as a council member, you hear what's in front of you. And it sounds like, nope, 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 we don't want it. And that can appear to resonate as, as being across the community, but that's not the case. Most folks that I talk to say, we need growth. We need the housing. Now it needs to be done smart. It needs to be mindful, but we need it because right now yeah. our biggest export are our children. And that is just wrong, wrong. And, and our export, our, our children, we're, what we're seeing at the Grassroot Institute is, you know, over since 2016, 22,000 residents on net have, have moved to the mainland. And uh, that trend seems to be getting greater as the cost of living is just so high here. Um, so yes, there, I think there are a lot of people that would, you know, definitely like to see a house for them. Um, now on Hawaii County, you guys are also updating your general plan and, and zoning and subdivision code. Um, what we've seen on the other islands is the number of shall or <laughs> instead of may in those plans seems to increase over time. And that adds to the, the regulation. Now, does um, updating the general plan and the and the zoning and subdivision code does that always mean more regulations or could it also mean lighter regulations perhaps? Yeah, um, the goal is to actually have lighter regulations to have the regulations where they're needed. And so our goal through this general plan update and code update is to say, hey, if we want it to be in this area, let's make that easy. In the areas that we don't want it, let's regulate and prohibit that. Very simple. So with our general plan update, I'm very um, attentive to shells and we have lots of good debate with, with our team members around this. So we're working towards, again, more of a dynamic plan that solves for our problems, not another plan of how do we regulate, but also a plan that will collectively bring the departments together to solve these issues around infrastructure. Because when the county's siloed and you're not working together for infrastructure to pave the way, that's also a challenge. And that's what I want the general plan to ultimately do, be used for uh, the truly how it's supposed to be, not just a planning tool, but a guide for our county and where to prioritize our infrastructure and where we want housing, where we want growth and say, great, you're there. Let's go forward with it. Same thing with our code. Our subdivision code was last updated in 1983. Our zoning code, 1997. This is the first comprehensive update. So we're going through, um, we have a tight time frame on it. We're going to get it done in a year and a half. And we're going to be looking at smaller lot sizes, you know, really just going through all of these areas. When you see a 201H, like an affordable housing project, and they ask for all these variances, why do they have to go through that process to get the variances? If it's, a, if it's an affordable project, shouldn't that just be baked into our code? Shouldn't you just select from the menu and say, that's what I'm doing? So that's the goal is to really make it more 
cost-effective, achievable, and certainty. Certainty is the big deal. You got to have a level of certainty if you, we want housing. And, and that brings us to a concept called buy right development, which um, basically it is if a housing project meets all the pre-established criteria, then it has the right to be developed rather than having to go through tons of public hearings where it can be killed. So this is something that uh, the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization has discussed. Um, do you think that could help on the Big Island, buy right housing? Yeah, I think it can help in some certain areas. So the buy rights usually brought together with form-based code. So you can really maintain form-based code gets you a level of certainty on what your place is going to be developed as and keeps it looking a certain way. I think by can right. Talk, uh, what is that uh, form based code? Form, can you define form based that? versus like Euclidean. Euclidean zoning talks about just more of the basic here's your zoning, here's what you can and cannot do. Form based says you can pretty much do any of this within this area, but it's got to look a certain way. It's got to be two stories, got to have that nice street frontage, it's got to maintain your sense of place, more character. Kauai's done a couple uh, programs that they've done on their island. So we're looking at that. Our first layer through the code is to really stabilize it to get us back to ground zero and look at how we can bring in the buy right and the form based in there. Now, the challenge with that is going to be communication because there's a lot of misperception out there. There's a lot of uh, lack of trust that people feel like, hey, if it's buy right, they're just going to do anything. You're going to sell out the Hawaii. And that's not the case. The case is how do we have the right tools to solve for it? And I think having a, a level of communication, understanding broad reach to allow for this is going to be essential with creating that foundation to move forward with buy right in the right areas. Thanks. So is there anything else that you'd like to add? add? We kind of did a whirlwind tour about Hawaii uh, housing, um, but any takeaway for our viewers? Yeah, I mean, from a Hawaii County perspective, we're solving as fast as we can. Um, we're doing a um, uh, chapter 11, which is our housing, uh, Susan Kuntz, our housing administrator is doing an update to that as well to look at the inclusionary zoning on what does and doesn't work. When we first came in for affordable housing, we had around 400 units or so in the pipeline. Now we have closer to 5,000 units in the pipeline. So now granted that's a move in the right direction. They're not all built yet, but what we're seeing is a push towards that. And, you know, on my side, you know, being born and raised here, just, you know, want, want to make sure that our children have the opportunity to stay here or come back home if they do, if they want to. And uh, housing is one of those essential elements. So it, it's, it's folks like you and your organization and others that we can collectively come together, have this conversation and move us towards solutions. Well, thanks so much for having us, or, uh, for, for being on the program today. And, uh, you know, Hawaii Island is uh, probably the last affordable quote unquote place in Hawaii, but it's still unaffordable <laughs> for most people. So uh, thanks so much for the work you're doing. And uh, thank you for listening to Hawaii Together. Uh, I'm Joe Kent. Uh, thanks again. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.